This morning is Palm Sunday, and we'll be looking at 2 Timothy chapter 4 in relation to the Palm Sunday Gospel. We'll be talking about love speaks with urgency. There is a time and a place to speak about Christ, to be the light of the world. Let's not miss any opportunities. And peace be yours today from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. From 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8 and 16 through 18, Paul writes, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed, and all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack, and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Palm Sunday also called Passion Sunday. On this day we begin the week which is called Holy. The most holy week of the year as we prepare now to celebrate the first, the most important of all Christian festivals, the coming of Easter. But we can't reach Easter without going through Holy Week, through the time of Passion. And it begins with our Lord's arrival in Jerusalem. We're familiar with the account of that Sunday as Jesus leaves Bethany, sends his disciples to Bethphage there on the Mount of Olives to collect an unridden colt. And there the festival procession begins. Pilgrims from all over, his disciples following in train, picking up palm branches, waving them in victory because the victorious king is now arriving in his holy city, the city of God, Jerusalem. And down the mountain, the festal train goes past Gethsemane into the valley of Kidron and up Mount Moriah into Jerusalem. And there he passes through the golden gate and up the great stairway into the temple. For God has returned to his people. The glory of God is once again in his temple. Jesus on Palm Sunday is a picture of great joy and celebration. Many of the people there didn't understand it, of course. They knew this was Jesus, the great prophet, who had done so many miracles, who had done so many proofs that he was from God. Some of them hoped that this was the fulfillment of the coming of the political king, the king, the son of David, who would retake the kingdom of David and there he would reign for eternity or so long and reestablish that great theocracy, that great monarchy. Others were just excited to be there. And still others, like you and I, had we been there as the disciples of Christ, would have celebrated the fulfillment of all that the Old Testament had promised us. The fulfillment of God's love, the fulfillment of God's law, and this one whom Isaiah foretells as the suffering servant. Whom Isaiah says that his life would be poured out as a drink offering. The final offering of the sacrifices in the temple, the pouring out of the strong drink, the undiminished pure wine in honor of God 
at the close of the service. And now Jesus is being poured out as a drink offering at the end of his life. For all things have now come together that God established before the foundation of the world for you and for me, the salvation of all people through the life, the death, and the resurrection of Christ. Paul talks about being poured out today in our text as a drink offering as well. He's had a difficult life as a Christian missionary, as the leader of Christian missionaries to the Gentile world, bringing Christ to the nations. And they're proclaiming the glory of God through not only powerful acts and words, but fully proclaiming the gospel of Christ. Paul is sitting in prison, the sentence proclaimed, awaiting now his execution. He is being poured out. You know, there is in, I think, Craigslist, and I believe it started in 2000, something there called misconnections. It's about people who maybe encountered someone and they missed an opportunity to speak to them, to create a, a rapport with them. Uh, for example, a cute brunette with green eyes is shopping with your sister in the, her sister in the mall, and a young man in a brown shirt bumps into her at Cinnabon, but he's too shy to give her his phone number, and so he writes on Craigslist. Misconnection. A gentleman sitting with a stack of books, perhaps riding on the subway across from a blonde-haired lady with a red jacket reading USA Today. He asks what time it is, and she smiles very prettily at him, and maybe he goes and writes under misconnections. The challenge is, though, that there are so many of these, so many people putting these out. It just takes such a minuscule percent of people who really actually read them and find them. You have to be the right person reading at the right time in order to see the ad, and then if you are even interested to respond. You know, in a greater way today, we are faced with missed connections, missed opportunities. Paul was that way himself in our text. As great as Paul was, as many times as he stood up and faced <laughs> crowds and jail and stonings and beatings and all of the many things that he faced in order to proclaim the love of God and to speak the love of God with urgency to the people. Paul also knows that he had missed opportunities in his life to proclaim the gospel of Christ just like you and I. Jesus rides into Jerusalem for us. And in his love he finds us and he calls us to be his own and he gives us a purpose and he says, be a light in this dark world of my love. And maybe like Paul, we're very aware as life goes on that we have missed opportunities to talk about his love, to speak of his love. Maybe there have been times when we know we should have and we intended to, but we backed off because of the pressure. It's a very difficult thing to do, to miss opportunities and to think, oh, I wish I had only said or done this. Paul is using this opportunity that God has given him to speak before the emperor and the great leaders of the Roman Empire. He uses this final opportunity to proclaim Christ with his very life. And as he writes to the young pastor Timothy, he encourages him as well in verse 2. He says to be prepared in season and out to speak the word of Christ. 
And you and I are called to speak about that word as well. To speak of the great day of festivity, of the waving of the palm branches, of the songs of the children, of Jesus' very words to the Pharisees, that even if all of these were quiet, the very stones themselves would sing God's praise because of what is about to take place today. And we, like those disciples, follow him into Jerusalem and celebrate his arrival in the great city of God. And like Paul's friends, too, who were with him going to Rome, we have all found times in our lives where we have run away, where we have not been all that we could be, when we have perhaps wilted into the wallpaper rather than to be the taste of salt in the light of the world. But you know what? As we sang in the hymn this morning, he rides on, he rides on in majesty. Why has he come to Jerusalem this morning? He has come to die for you. Despite it all, despite of our failings, despite of all of our missed opportunities, despite of everything, he comes to pour his life out as a drink offering. That in him, we might have the forgiveness of our sins. Of all the things that we have ever said or done or thought that made us enemies of God, outcasts from God's people and from his church, he comes to set it right. It doesn't matter who we are or where we've been or what's taken place in our life. He loves us just the, th the same. And though we're not worthy, He will make us worthy through the power of His Word, through the gift of His sacraments, through the Spirit of God, which comes through the means of grace and makes His home in your heart <coughs> so that you, by faith, might be a child of God. In the lesson that we read this morning, Paul goes on to say, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith, and now is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing the crown of righteousness. It's not by our own efforts that we receive that crown. That crown is not so much of a reward here as an award. Imagine, imagine that we who have so often missed connections and opportunities in our life, in this world that is winding down and is coming to a close with the urgency which Christ gives to us before the time is too late, before the world is ended, before our life is over, before those to whom we speak have gone and not heard the word at all, the urgency with that word comes as it comes with urgency into Jerusalem today on the back of a donkey. Nevertheless, nevertheless, he is prepared to award you the crown of eternal life. He does that not because we have been so faithful, not because by our supposed good works, our own human efforts, we have earned it, but he does that because Christ has lived the life that we will never live. Because Christ 
has walked the path that we cannot walk because of his perfect life, because of his innocent suffering and death, because of the gift of grace, he says to you and me, I will give you what my only begotten Son has earned. Here, receive his crown of life. Now, to depart, he says, to be untied, literally, as a ship is loosed from its moorings and the sails rise, he is ready to set sail from this shore to the distant shore, to his home port, to the place that God has prepared for him with Christ in heaven. You and I too, because of God's love, know that when our time in this world comes to an end, that God will lose our ship from its moorings and will gently sail us to that great and distant shore, the home of righteousness that Christ has prepared for us. He does that entirely because of Palm Sunday. He does that entirely because of Holy Week and the coming Passion. He does that entirely for you in his resurrection. Because you see, through the water and the word, he has made you his own. And in Christ, and you are in Christ, you have been baptized into that crucifixion. And as you came a new person through the waters of baptism, so you are a new child of God, reborn, born from above. Born holy and perfect in the robe of Christ's righteousness and wearing the crown of life that can never ever be taken from you. This morning as we sing our songs of praise and we remember the hosannas and the blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Don't forget that he comes. He comes. He comes for you. And he comes for me. He comes in humility. He comes in love. The eternal Son of God. He comes to make you and I his own. To forgive our sins. And to take us home. To be with him forever. The time is short. We don't know how long we have left. Love today speaks with urgency those words of life to you and I. And Paul urges us this morning to speak those words with urgency to others that we might make the connection those wonderful words of life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand for a blessing. If you'd like to hear more on this or any other topic, please find us on the web at emmanuelnrh.net. Please join us for worship Sunday mornings at 9 a.m., Bible class and Sunday school at 10.30 a.m.